This podcast series is supported by members at Patreon. If you want to support this podcast series, head to patreon.com forward slash Cascadian Beer. Breweries come in all shapes and sizes, some large, some small, and some might just be hiding in your neighbor's garage. Welcome to the Cascadian Beer Podcast. My name's Aaron and I'm a Cascadian. I have a background in radio and television broadcasting. I'm a music producer and have a passion for beer. I don't consider myself to be an expert in beer by any means, but I do enjoy and respect the craft and the passion of these brewmasters. I want to learn from these pioneers on what sets them apart from the rest and why they choose to call Cascadia their home. Cascadia is a bioregion in the Pacific Northwest on the North American continent. It's made up of the U.S. states of Washington and Oregon, as well as the Canadian province of British Columbia. In this podcast series, I'll be profiling the unique breweries of Cascadia, a region that has a strong presence on the international beer scene. In this episode, I'm just outside of Seattle in the city of Bothell. Here is a very unique brewery making English-style beers in the back shed and serving it in the garage in the front yard. This from Foggy Noggin. My name is Jim Jameson. And what is your title here? Well, I'm the I do I'm the head of everything. You know, mainly uh, you know it's cleaning, uh, janitor. Um, but uh, started the brewery uh, with, in my mind as a vision, and it's a family operation now. So um, all the owners are my kids and my wife and my brother in law, and run Foggy Noggin as a family business with uh, our our great detail to English style beers. And why did you come up with the name Foggy Noggin? Well, a couple of things. I mean, if if you ever woke up in the morning after you had a few too many, you end up with a little bit of a foggy noggin. And we, you know, long, long time ago, it used to be involved in a uh, golf tournament, and uh, it was the um, single malt classic, so single malt um, I, uh, Scottish whiskeys. And we needed to have a place to hold our banquet at the end and have dinner, and we're going to have it at my house. And you can't just call it. Jim's house. You got to have a name. So, after sampling all the the whiskeys before the event, we we're going to have had plenty of foggy noggins. That's how the name started. All right. So, how long have you been open then? We opened March of 2010, so about six and a half years. And this is interesting because we're actually sitting in your driveway right now, and the space that's open to the public is your garage. Why is it like that, and how is that legal? Well, like any other, um, any brewery in the United States, um, you've got to the same restrictions that we have. You get your um, federal TTB, uh, Alcohol Tobacco Tax Bureau, um, brewing license approved. You have to get your state liquor license approved. Uh, for us, it's the uh, Washington State um, Liquor Control Board, and then you have to get your local AHJ involved, which is Snohomish County for us. And since it's on a residential property, we also have to adhere to all the home-based business regulations too. You know, it's it's as difficult plus some as anybody else has to do. We have to blend in with the community, um, operation of hours, um, you know, all those restrictions, signage restrictions, and all those kinds of things. Um, the cool thing is when people get here, they kind of get why we end up doing it here. It's very secluded. We've got two and a half acres. You feel like you're in the middle of nowhere with just great English beers. And we're only like five minutes from the highway too. So that's right. Does everybody in the neighborhood come by when you when you open up? And how and how often are you open? We're only open on Saturdays. Every Saturday afternoon from twelve to five p.m. We get a lot of neighbors that will walk. We get uh, a lot of new people. We're a destination for people when they come to the area. They've heard about us, the uniqueness, and our focus on English beers and being in this cool uh, residential uh, walk into a guy's garage and you feel like you're at a friend's house and that's kind of what we get you know when houses go for sale in the in the in the walking distance they usually sell in the first weekend in the market uh, have an open house i'll have somebody come in and ask question you know how often do you open i say every saturday they go every saturday i go yep okay we're buying the house having a walking entertainment stop is a pretty cool feature when you're out in the residential area in suburban you know seattle yeah 
And especially if you're having a dinner party at your house, you come over here for the pre-drinks, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. (laughs) So where is your uh, brew house then? Our house is located about halfway in our two and a half acres of property. And in the back uh, third is a 200 square foot uh, building we built for the brewery. It wasn't there when we started. Our intention was to brew in the garage, but the TTB wouldn't let us do that. So we had to build a separate building. And you would look at it and you go, You've, okay, you're brewing in a shed. And it really is a shed, but it has to meet commercial building um, requirements. So it's the most expensive shed I think anyone's ever built. <laughs> you have a lot of a lot of stuff crammed in there. Uh, how many how many tanks do you have? Well, we have a half-barrel brew system, uh, all gravity-fed. And then we have six uh, stainless steel conical fermenters that are half-barrel fermenters, and then we have one Hungarian oak fermenter that we uh, have a perpetual yeast going in there. So seven fermenters. Ran out of space for bright tanks, so we have a cooler that we put the beer into a to to get that cold crashing and clean the beers out. How long does it take you to turn that beer around and get it on tap? Most beers is, is 21 days from brew day to serve day. Some take longer. Some take two weeks to ferment instead of a week. Some take even longer than that. We did a, we've done our barley wine twice and it takes us about 12 weeks to completely ferment that out. And, you know, it's 11.3% uh, English barley wine and we've never served it yet. So we, we're aging the 2013 and the 2015 and if things work out, we'll do a 16 version of it as well. So how long have you been brewing then in, in total, and how did you start? I started brewing in 1992. It was a uh, Christmas present my wife gave me, and, you know, if if I would have been a smart person, I would have quit because I brewed a lot of bad beer initially, but I don't like to fail on things, so I said, you know, it can't be that tough. There's a lot of good home brew out there, and people were doing it even back then when ingredients weren't as readily available as they are today. What I ended up doing was focusing on... What do I want to make? Because you, if you're if you're trying to brew an IPA today and a porter the next day and a stout the next day and then a pale ale and you're never going to learn anything. So the beer that we have in front of us right here is our English bitters. The first beer I perfected after about a hundred batches of what I wanted it to be, and that's when I really learned how to brew, how ingredients, temperatures, um, fermentation, carbonation. Um, how they work and what each grain tastes like, what each hop does at different parts of the beer. And so through trial and error, a lot of reading, um, that's how I kind of figured out on my own what makes sense for me. And why did you choose to focus on English style ales? Well, as I started to learn about beer when I was in college, um, there was a great beer bar that had about 1,200 beers in bottles. It was every beer that the state of Oregon allowed you to bring into the state. I like to think I tasted them all, and I'm not sure if I did or not. There was a a menu they had, and I would fold it up and carry it with me wherever I went, and I would mark off the beers as I tried them. At the end of the day, the ones that I kept coming back to were the, the British style, you know, the Scottish, the Irish, the English beers. It was couple of reasons. It was the balance. It was the approachability. It was the sessionability, you know, where you can taste every ingredient in them and they were really enjoyable. Typically, they're lower alcohol beers, lower carbonated beers. They didn't fill you up as much. Um, great pleasure in tasting them. Uh, you know, to this day, it's my favorite style, although I really enjoy all kinds of styles of beers. But um, as a brewer, I think that you become better at your craft if you really narrow your focus and and really research out and, and every day practice what you want to do. So with the, the kit that you have and your focus on, on style, how many taps do you have? We usually have 10 beers flowing in our tasting room every Saturday. Two will be nitro pours um, and eight will be CO2. The nitro pours, um, I think, is since we're only open one day a week, I really would love to have real cast scale on tap. The problem is, you know, you need to really drink that cask in three days. We're only open five hours a week. You know, eventually we'll open a second location. We'll have more hours. We'll keep this place always. And there we'll have real beer engines, and we'll be able to do some of our cask uh, versions of our beers. And I think I've had them before. I've made them. I've had them in events, and they're they're, they're fantastic. Our beers lend to that really well. But uh, putting them on nitro is the next best thing to having on cask. You know, it's the um, it's the smoothness, it's the accentuation of the flavors of the beer, and um, it's just a, another fun way to to sample our beers. And your daughter is actually back there today. It's her first brew. She's been off for a few weeks. When did she start brewing with you? Well, the first three years we were open, I brewed every batch uh, myself, and um, I have three kids. So my oldest son uh, Matthew uh, was the first that was interested in brewing, and 
it took quite a while, you know, him brewing with me, me uh, mentoring him, watching him. I'm very particular on our product. And so the output had to be the same whether he was brewing it or me. And so uh, I can't remember exactly how many batches we went through before I turned the reins on him. Um, then soon after that, my daughter, Stephanie, was interested as well. So got her trained up. And I can't tell the difference if it's a beer I made or a beer they made. They they come out tasting exactly the same. And uh, what brew number are you at today? I think today was 1,353. So that's a lot of brews. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like a great stats guy to keep track of all that. Yeah. Um, so uh, you mentioned a, a second location. Is that thoroughly in the works or is that a few years off still? We've been working for about three years with the city of Bothell. We'd like to stay local. I mean, we've been very serious. We thought we had a location that kind of fell through with the property owner to the point where, you know, I worked a year and a half with this, the planning commission and got some an area of Bothell rezoned. Uh, so you could put a brewery there. We're still working on another location in that area. And we're pursuing a couple other options too. Nothing firm, um, but uh, when the right thing will happen, it, you'll know it will be the right thing. And you just don't sell here too. I see some bottles in the fridge there. Do you ship it out anywhere? Or yeah, about 90% of our beer goes through our tasting room. And then I have about 20 tap accounts from Bellingham to Tacoma and... When I can get beer to them, they're happy. Once in a while, bottle shops will get them a, a case or so, but we mainly keep the bottles here. What I like to know is they're being refrigerated, they're being taken care of, and when people take them home, they're going to taste like they're supposed to. You ever walk into a big grocery store and you see those stacks and stacks of bottles of beer, and I go, that's just not good. I mean, you know, how long has it been sitting like this, and is the beer still going to be good? So, you know, freshness, um, how it's served, um, the CO2 level that it's poured on, all those things are so important. And once it leaves my hands, I don't know how it's going to be taken care of. So the reason I only have about 20 tap accounts is I have tap accounts I can trust and I know that they take care of it correctly. Staff understands what they're serving. Kegs stay cold. They individual pressure on their CO2 so they can lower it for our beers because I don't want to overcarbonate them, all those kinds of things. Through this whole process of you being open here, um, there's been quite a boom in the Pacific Northwest in recent years. What's been your observation of that? Do you think this is a flash in the pan or is this uh, good, good for development for beer in general in the Pacific Northwest? I think when any industry is in a growth mode, you're going to attract a lot of people that bring um, both good and both not so good um, elements to the industry. I think you're bringing a lot of creativity, new ideas, um, pushing the envelope, maybe waking up some people who kind of got complacent who were there before and they get a brewery across the street. Hey, I got to step my game up. I think those are good things. Um, but you also get people in the market who don't have the experience. They really don't know. They can't duplicate the beers. The market will correct itself. But I think it's a great time when, to be a beer enthusiast. There's a lot of options, a lot of really good beer out there. Um, unfortunately, with a lot of good beer, it comes a lot of bad beer. And so as consumers, we get to vote with our, our wallet on those who stay in business and those who don't. Have you re received any awards for any beer that you've made? You know, we really aren't a participant in the beer competitions. We've gotten awards out of some of the magazines uh, like Northwest Brewing News, where the readers will submit what their favorites are. And, uh, you know, we're honored to always win those things because that's really the customer base is so passionate about their beers that they want to go vote for you. Those are the fun awards to get. Uh, we've won Best Brewery in Bothell, uh, the North Shore area, which they call Kenmore, Bothell, Woodenville. We've won that award. Um, we've won some Best of Show at some beer festivals. Um, we did enter our first uh, GABF entries for this year, which uh, will be early October announced. I'm not really too... Um, worried about winning or losing. I think it was just good to get the feedback and, and see. Um, we entered in um, our English IPA with rye in it uh, in the English IPA category, and we entered a an alt style. So since we do English beers, but we do alt is the one non-English beer we do, and this is a double alt. And so it was named after my second grandchild, um, Mary. And so it's a, it's a 8.1% big um Imperial Alt, really, but we call it a double alt, and uh, we'll see. It's one of my favorite beers. Well, what, what is your favorite beer to brew? They're all fun. Um, all the beers are fun because, you know, we, we modify the water to match the U.K. region that we want to duplicate for that beer, um, which is fun, that whole process of changing the water chemistry, you know, measuring all the ingredients and getting to smell them and using all the British hops that we use, and it's just a, in, they're all just equally as enjoyable to, to brew. 
The question I always get is, you know, people come in who've never been here. Well, what's your favorite beer that's on tap? And I said, it's the one I'm drinking at the time. Because I wouldn't serve it if I didn't really like it. If it doesn't pass that test, if I wouldn't be a drinker of that beer, I wouldn't put it on tap. And uh, who's inspiring you in the local community with uh, their beer, like some some different breweries? Who who do you really like? You know, um, there's a lot of really good beer out there. And um, there's a couple of breweries I could say I like just everything they do. And, you know, one of the ones in particular, I send a lot of people there when they come. They're not from the Seattle area, is uh, Maritime Pacific down in Ballard. They've been around since 88. They've been doing a long time. And I don't think I've ever had a beer they've made that I didn't like. Right. And if uh, anybody wanted to go down this route, what advice would you give them to open their own brewery? Uh, if they want to go to a small scale like us, don't do it. It's a lot of lot of work. It's it's tough to to make it financially make sense. You have to be passionate about it and just love it. And uh, and it's more about the experience and um, the culture you're building and that bonding with your community. Um, you know, we've become such a important part of the local community on participating in fundraisers and auctions and um, seeing people come here because they want to bring their community group here and meet. And you know, those are just the, the fun connections. You know, our next chapter of, of expansion, I think financial will, will reward us. You know, we do okay here, you know, but you just look at our scale. You just can't do that well at, at this size. But there's a lot of rewards we get every day. And um, but if you don't want to brew like a maniac, this is a, a bad model to do. We brewed 240 batches last year in 2015. You just think about it, that's a lot of brewing. It takes about five hours a batch, and you say that's and, and we all have regular jobs. So my my uh, um, saying has always been: there's plenty of time to sleep when you're dead, and um, that's what you got to have because you don't sleep much when you're when you're doing this. Yeah, so you're brewing pretty much every evening, right, when you come home? We'll do, to, to save a little time, we'll do uh, multiple batches. Like Saturdays and Sundays are typically two or three batch days. Um, I've done four batches in one day, and you get a little bit of efficiency. You can carve off maybe an hour and a half on a, each brew when you do multiples, but uh, uh, that's you're exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> and what is uh, your favorite beer that you make to pair with your favorite food? That's what it's the one I got. I'm drinking at the time. You know, I'll drink a different beer for different reasons. You know, if I the beer we got in front of us, the English bitter, is three point four percent. There's times where you know you're going to be at a you know a, a barbecue and you're going to want to have five or six pints. This is a great beer for that because you're going to be able to get back home and you're going to wake up the next morning refreshed, go back to work. Um, there's beers that are a little heavier or a little more aggressive on the flavors. You only want one or two. You know, you pick those for different reasons or for food pairing. You know, if you're going to be having something spicy or something, you know, uh, really rich and succulent, if you have, you know, those are different reasons, just like you'd pair wine with it or with cheese. I think cheese is way overlooked on how it pairs so well with, with beer. And I think people are starting to wake up to that because it, it's, there's so many great combinations of making those cheese flavors match that beer uh, flavor. And if uh, somebody came here and they'd never been here before, what would be the thing you would like them to leave with uh, at the end of the day, apart from a bottle or a growler? I think most people on their first time here, they get a little education. I think they're unfamiliar on what English ales are all about. Because we couldn't be further from England, really, where we are. We are along, we're about exactly halfway across the world from England. And, you know, they, you know typically a, a brand new customer that I've never seen before, and you ask them, you know, um, what they'd like to have. And, the first thing is just, you know, you have an IPA and it's, it, it's, it's kind of my running joke is because you start talking to people. There's many times we don't have an IPA on tap. You know, I ask them uh, questions about what they like in a beer. I don't have one, but what are you looking for a beer? And at the end, it's usually they're just not that aware of beer. They don't know. But when they go out with their friends, they all order IPAs. So that's the only thing they know how to order. And when they leave here, they go, you know what? I'm so glad that you gave me something other than IPA. I really like it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Big thanks to Jim for his time. Really enjoyed the beers that I had while I was there, including the IPA range that he had on tap. The beers are always so fresh and rotating so quickly, you just really need to pay a visit and see what's on tap. Thanks for listening to the Cascadian Beer Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends, as well as leaving us a review on either iTunes or Stitcher. It really helps us get this into as many ears as possible. Also visit the website Cascadian.beer and follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cascadian Beer or on Twitter at Cascadian Beer. 
Thank you so much again for listening. Until next time, remember, support your local.